before I started recording this episode, I asked AI to write me lyrics for a protest song and to do it in the styling of a pop song. And I asked it to write lyrics that were ref- like reflected the current state of the world. And it did. So I decided to make a pop protest track with those lyrics. And here it is. In a world that's torn by strife and fear, we stand together, our voices clear. In justice rampant, we won't be blind. It's time to rally, it's time to find. It's time to find hope in the darkness. Unity will unfurl. This is our protest song, it's a brand new world. We'll fight for justice. Discrimination will no longer embrace. Together we'll rise, we'll tear down these walls for a world where compassion enthralls. Hope in the darkness, unity will unfurl. This is our protest song, it's a brand new world. We'll fight for justice, let our voices be heard. In the song of change, we'll speak every word. Through the chaos, we'll find a way. We'll bring the day with love as our armor and truth as our guide. We'll stand as one, side by side. Hope in the darkness, unity will unfurl. This is our protest song, it's a brand new world. We'll fight for justice, let our voices be heard. In the song of change, we'll speak every word. The planet is crying, it's time to defend. The damage is done, we must die. For nature's sake, we'll make a stand Protect our earth, it's our sacred land With this song of protest, we'll rise above A world transformed by the power of love Together we'll strive, together we'll soar In this song of hope, we'll sing it once more Hope in the darkness, unity will unfurl This is our protest song, it's a brand Let our voices be heard in the song of change. We'll speak every word. I feel like I nailed it. I don't know. This is such a huge topic, and there's there, there's so much to say on this one. And this could actually be an entire podcast all on its own. And I don't even mean just one podcast episode. Like this could be the whole basis for an entire podcast show. And I'm sure that it is. Um on some of my other episodes, I do more historical deep dives on topics. And this one will get historical a little bit, but instead of going through music history like chronologically and its impact chronologically throughout time, I'm more so going to be talking about uh talking about this in a broader sense. Things won't necessarily be in order. And I'm going to jump around a bit. So just a heads up on that with some of my other episodes. If you've, if you've like become accustomed to that format of chronological sort of storytelling, historical retelling, this is going to be a little different than that. I also plan to hit different angles on how music affects us. Neurologically, um, on a sociopolitical level and on a spiritual level. So I'm going to kind of be bouncing between those, between those fields. For me, I think art in all of its forms, including music, are the most important pieces of culture and society. They impact people. They build empathy and they, 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 they sway big decisions inside of societies and they influence people to be better without art in all of its forms we like culture 
as we know it would really be bland and and weird. I don't think it could exist without art. I don't I just don't think it's possible. And even beyond influencing people who make big decisions, it influences people who make every decision. It cha- it plants seeds and it changes perception and it changes the way that we go about our day and the way that we go about our lives and this has like a a big ripple effect to people who are in our uh direct sphere of of influence and it really i know it's like a hippie thing to say but it really does change the world in it starts in small ways and grows and grows and grows and and then eventually works in really big ways and even on a personal level there's ob- there's like obvious connections that we all get from music even beyond society as a whole it can enhance our moods it can get us motivated it can help us think it can make us dance it's one of the most versatile forms of art and communication it's always fascinated me from a very young age and i've been obsessed with music my entire life i'm not going to go into my whole musical journey on this episode because that's a super long story um and i promise it's this isn't a i'm not like humble bragging here just genuinely i want to express my deep love for music i play a plethora of instruments some of which i am proficient and others which i'm just kind of like i just dabble in i love writing lyrics and incorporating lyrics into music i love messing with sound design and programming beats on the computer i'd say musically i'm probably the most proficient with um piano piano guitar mandolin and kind of on the banjo and drums honestly drums and drum pads come before mandolin and, and banjo piano guitar drums mandolin mandolin banjo and i know drums and and like finger drumming they're very different but also kind of not really i also do uh dabble in the harmonica as well <laughs> Other other instruments that I have are the clarinet and the ukulele, which I do love, but I wouldn't say I'm anywhere close to proficient at, but they are really fun to play. And even before I got into really learning how to play any of these instruments, I've always just loved making music. They don't do it so much anymore, but stores um like back in my day when I was a kid, they used to um they used to set keyboards up in stores so you could go demo them. And when we would go anywhere to shop and they had these these demo keyboards set up they used to be at like walmart kmart uh just like department stores just kind of kind of everywhere they would be sitting up in the back like if if there was an electronics department there would be like they still do it today with the video games where you can go and like demo video games but imagine that replace the video game with keyboards that used to be a very common thing and I'm in my 30s, so like people in their 30s and beyond will probably remember that. But if you're listening and you're before that age range, I don't think they do it so much anymore, unless obviously you're at a music store. But it used to be a really common thing. And when we would go uh, shopping, I would I would usually immediately go find uh, those demo keyboards and play around with them until we had to leave the store just the, ent- the entire time. And my mom would be like... <laughs> My mom would be like, "We're ready to check out. We gotta go," and I'd still be on one of the keyboards or in the or in the toy aisle. One of those two places, usually the keyboard zone, is where I hung out <laughs> when when we went shopping. My mom and my stepdad bought me my first keyboard actually, and it was so precious to me. It's actually set up in my son's room for him to practice on, along with a bunch of other instruments, mostly percussion, like like handshakers and little tambourines and stuff like that. That's more his speed right now, but his keyboard is plugged in and ready to go at any moment. He usually will, uh, I'll put it on like an organ sound and he'll just hammer on the keys and it'll, and then he'll hit it like a drum and it'll, I think he's probably going to wind up being a drummer because he just also, uh, I don't, I don't know. He, he might just like just banging on things because he does that a lot. <laughs> so I think he kind of has a rhythm though. He'll, he'll bob to music and it's usually pretty on time or he'll like tap or clap and it's usually pretty on time. So I wouldn't be surprised if he grew up to be a, uh, a drummer. 
Also, I just wanted to say that my stepdad pawned his saxophone to help pay for my first guitar. And I will never take that for granted. There's something really magical to that. He he didn't play his saxophone really anymore, but it was always there as an option for him, you know? Like, I'm here if you ever feel like revisiting this journey. Yeah, mom, it's always I'm always here. I'll always it'll always be an option for you. But I think he knew that his time with that instrument was over and that he could repurpose that energy into my journey. And I remember that just like learning that he did that and being like, wow, that's really, that's really special to me. Even as a kid, I was like, dang, that's so, cause I already had such a deep like fascination and, and, and love for music to think of someone giving that up or like sacrificing that for me was really special to me. And I remember it was a Christmas present and I kind of have to preface this with some context. Uh, I am a, I am just a clumsy person. And during this particular part of my youth, especially this year, I think I was like 12 or 11, 11 or 12, somewhere in there. I was frequently accidentally getting cut I was outside a lot, and I was either like, you know, I'd either like, like, cut myself on a thorn or fall off my bike or brush against just like a sharp edge, kid, like kid stuff, you know. And I was clumsy. I'm still clumsy. But during that particular time, I would go through a lot of band aids. So for Christmas that year, I opened up what I thought were all of my presents. My mom and stepdad saved this one last present. Kind of like, oh yeah, you forgot to open open this one. And they tossed me this small box. Uh, and it was a wrapped box of Band-Aids. And I was like, oh, haha, I get it. I uh, know, I'm a klutz. I, and so this is, you know, very funny, guys. And they were like, haha, yeah, look inside. So I opened the box and taped to the inside flap was a guitar pick. And then they just said, go find it. And I started running frantically throughout the house until I found it. And that's honestly how my personal music with Journey really got started, was this first guitar that I, th this was like where I started to be able to dive in on my own time into playing music. I, at school, I would start printing out guitar tablature and I would start like pilling my brain, my, my grandpa's brain for all of his techniques and tricks because he was, my grandpa at the time, well, he was the only person in our family that really was playing music. He had a guitar and a banjo and a mandolin. Um, so anytime we would visit them and I would just start going over there more so we could jam and he could show me his tricks and techniques. And it was really cool hanging out with him and learning he was like bluegrass country guy, and he he also liked fifties and sixties rock music too. So he had this rockabilly, bluegrassy rockabilly playing style that I feel like really influenced the way that I looked at music from an early age, and I still kind of look at it that way, sort of m more melody driven, if that makes sense. And then I went on to like starting some bands, air quote, punk bands, death metal bands. Um, music became a real part of my existence at this point. Between my guitar and the keyboard that my parents got me a year or two after the guitar, it became a really tangible part of my life. It wasn't just this elusive thing anymore that I would hope to come into contact with at the store or at my grandparents' house. It was in my home now, and I was finding friends that loved it as much as I did. I was forming relationships with other people that spawned from a love of music, forming connections because of this love. Most of my closest friends are my closest friends because we found a common bond with music. It gave us a reason to hang out, something that went beyond video games or riding bikes around aimlessly. It was, it was something really special. It was a way to express ourselves, and it was a way to be creative and productive and release emotions and stress. And as teenagers, we all needed that. And another, another thing that's really cool is that 
we were actively getting into music. Like, you know, that like from from like 12 to 17-ish is when you're finding all the music you love and really diving into it, really absorbing the lyrics and melodies and finding out who you are. And I feel really blessed to have that piece of my life coincide with also finding other humans that felt a deep passion for music like I did. And it was a reflection of who we were and what we were going through. And sometimes it was raw, sometimes silly, sometimes dumb, sometimes sad. And we were discovering music like that. We were creating music like that. We were experiencing it together in this cool community that was being created through music. With this community, we started throwing shows. And other kids who maybe necessarily weren't even into music as much as us were coming out and connecting with music. And we were influencing the way they thought or at least encouraging them to think about life in a creative capacity. And like I said, I'm not going to go over this whole musical journey of mine here. There's just a lot to it, and maybe someday I'll do an episode on my personal musical journey up to this point, but I feel like there's still too much to do, and I'm still going to, you know, I'm going to save this full story for the future when I'm an old, crusty old man. (laughs) Then Then I'll tell that whole story. But um, just to like simplify, reduce it and simplify it, simplify it and round it out to get to today, eventually I got a, a cracked version of FL Studio. I think it was like FL5 and got into making electronic music. Um, and then I got into making hip hop and rap music and writing lyrics and spoken word type music. And eventually became obsessed with making electronic music and fusing organic elements in with with the electronic music. And that's where I'm at today. I've been touring and doing shows for a long time. And I've been doing solely music and art and being self-employed since May of 2016. And god damn, it's been a really intense really beautiful ride, and I wouldn't trade any of this beauty for anything. And a little, a little tangity, a little tangity side note here with my personal Mount Analog project. I've always done what feels right. If I want to make jazz, I do jazz. If I want to write lyrics, I do that. If I feel like making grindcore, I do that. And since day one, I've wanted my musical journey um, to encompass all genres and fusion of genres, just raw experimentation. So for the people who have been along for this journey of expression, thank you. I know it's not always easy not knowing what's coming next, um, but I feel like my genuine fans or people who are dialed into my genuine journey have come to anticipate the unexpected and hope for for variety and raw expression. So just thank you for letting me be myself. And it means, it means so much to my soul and to my heart that you are here with me exploring the um, infinite world of music. Enough about me. I've just been rambling about myself and where my heart is with music and that really just um that's really just my own personal journey and experience it's nowhere near as special as some of the things we're going to talk about today so let's get into the meat of the episode like i said this is a super broad topic with no real place to start or real place to end so we're going to just kind of bounce we're just going to kind of bounce we're going to be bouncy on this one So with that in mind, I decided to pick a plethora of cultural shifts and impacts on a societal and individual level that music has helped to uh, influence, inspire, and create. And music exerts a powerful influence on human beings. It can boost memory. It can build task, endurance, it can lighten your mood, it can reduce anxiety and depression, it can stave off fatigue, 
improve your response to pain and help you work or work out physically more effectively. There's so much data on how it affects the mind in a positive way. And it can also unite us in a really powerful way too. Just think about national anthems connecting crowds at sporting events or protest songs uh, stirring up a sense of shared purpose during marches or, or protests or hymns building group identity in houses of worship or love songs that build relationships or help bring people closer together or lullabies that enable parents and infants to develop secure attachments. And just think about how children learn. It's almost always with a song. We embed the information into a melody or rhyme. And there have been a bunch of studies at John Hopkins University that look into how music stimulates our brains. They did a bunch of MRI scans on people's brains that were listening to music and saw which parts were lighting up. Our brain is a supercomputer, and it's all intricately connected. If you stimulate one part of the brain, it's going to have an impact on another. And what these studies at John Hopkins found is that the parts of the brain that were being stimulated with music were also parts of the brain that, that are responsible for learning and retaining new information and skills. Music is kind of like a jump starter for learning. It activates important parts of our brain that get the juices flowing. And that's something that's something my my second grade teacher Mrs. Subler used to say. She would give it before tests she would give out gum. She would give everyone gum and she'd say, "Let's get those juices flowing." She didn't play music, but she actually would play music, but usually not during tests. She would like we I remember her giving us music time and being like, "Everyone listen to this song." And everyone would be silent and she would just play a song. And we would listen to it. And that was one of the only times I remember anyone in my life at that time just being like, "Hey, just shush. Listen to this song and then tell me what you think about it." And that was a really really um profound experience for a second grader. So big ups, big ups, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Subler. Also, it turns out that people feel more motivated to learn when they expect to hear a song they like as a reward, which makes sense. It's like getting some dopamine uh, as a treat after learning. In another study, researchers gave people tasks that required them to read and then recall short lists of words. Those who were listening to classical music outperformed those who worked in silence or with white noise. And they also tested this with solving puzzles and accuracy. The classical music also would have people more accurately solving puzzles just across the board. Remembering music is one of the biggest pieces of memory that is dementia-resistant. And I've actually had firsthand experiences with this. My sister is uh, an event coordinator at a care facility for elderly people. And she will have me come in once in a while to play music for people who live there. And there's one unit that, that's called the memory unit that is for people with dementia and people who are struggling with memory loss. And anytime I go there and play songs that they recognize, they will sing along to these songs. But then at the same time, they, you know, they won't remember other things that are basic pieces of life. So they won't remember, you know, how to, and I mean this with all due respect, they won't remember how to uh, use a fork or, remember how to walk, but they will be able to sing all of the words to songs that they know. For some reason, it's things, things like that are imprinted in our brains in really wild ways. And I don't under, fully understand it because I'm not a neuroscientist, but it is really crazy and cool to see that. Music has that kind of influence, and lyrics can have that kind of influence. 
And I think it speaks volumes to how important music is and how impactful it can be. Neurological researchers have found that music releases all kinds of good hormones and neurochemicals in our brains. Dopamine, a chemical associated with pleasure and reward centers, it lowers stress hormones like cortisol. It gives us bursts of hormones like serotonin and other hormones that are related to immunity. It can also release oxytocin, which is a chemical that fosters the ability to build connections with others. There was a 2017 research study done that concluded that listening to music, particularly classical combined with jazz, had a positive effect on depression, and especially when there were several listening sessions conducted by therapists. And then this next this list, next little nugget is right in front of us. Music can it can make you dance. It can get you moving. And moving and dancing obviously has all kinds of health health benefits. It can help your heart health. It can help your blood pressure regulation. Your, it, it forces you to stretch, um, which in turn releases all kinds of good hormones and chemicals. It can get you breathing. It, it, it basically makes you exercise when you dance. You are exercising. And then on the flip side to that, in 2015... At a Shanghai university, they found that relaxing music helped reduce fatigue and maintain muscle endurance when people were engaged in repetitive tasks. So exercising with music will actually have you getting more reps in and feeling less tired when you're done with your workout. But with all these with all these facts, I'm doing massive simplifications. You can read about all of these in depth online. I'm just reducing them for time's sake here. There's also this study where specially trained music therapists use music to help alleviate pain in inpatient and outpatient settings. In 2016, over 90 studies reported that music helps people manage both acute and chronic pain better than medication alone. If you want to read more about music's impact on health, I got the majority of this info from Healthline.com, where they have links to all of these, um, all of these studies, all of this research. You can dive deep and get into the nitty gritty of all of this if you if you feel like it. That's where I'm getting all these references from. So if you feel like doing the deep dive on healthline.com if you want to see how music can help your depression, help your exercise, help your problem solving, help enhance your mood on a much deeper level. Check it out. So these are some of the big psychological benefits of music on an individual level for each of us personally. But what about as a species? What is music doing for humanity? And it's doing a lot of things for us, but one of the one of the biggest things it's doing is it's bringing us together. And when we come together, we accomplish big things. An individual couldn't have been able to build a rocket and then fly to the moon and land on it. But a large group of people working together for many years made that happen and is are currently making that happen now. They they came together and worked and worked together to make something literally otherworldly happen. And as humans, when we come together, we can accomplish really great things. We can cure diseases, we can start revolutions, we can build supercomputers. It's all a collective experience. And art, in all of its forms, is really good at bringing us together in unifying us, and thus helping to aid in the progress of humanity. On a deeper level, music keeps us going. It ensures our survival. People write songs about what's going right or wrong, about how society should be governed, about heartbreak, about empathy. And don't get me wrong, this is all this is all great. All these things are great and uh But with everything, there's a duality, and there is a darker side to all of this too. 
I'm going to take us down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, just a slight little rabbit hole. So currently in the United, United States, corporations own the majority of the music industry. Over 70% of the biggest artists that most people are listening to are influenced by corporations that own the music industry. And not necessarily in a way where these artists are, uh, you know, embedding ads into their music, although sometimes they do. Um, but more so, these corporations are influencing the way that the artists write the music so that it's more economically viable, air quote, economically viable. And music that sells, music that is super palatable and digestible for the most amount of people. And that's where we get into the the real rabbit hole part of this. Because this isn't like this isn't necessarily bad. Why not make music that people like and people resonate with? And and I feel like the problem here is the corporate intention. And that that intention is embedded in the music. The intention for the profit is embedded in the music. So to kind of simplify this, for instance, someone like Taylor Swift on Republic Records, a huge record label, and she's one of the most popular artists in the world. When her team is writing music, I am sure that there are Republic Records business executives that weigh in on the music and lyrics as it's being written to see if it can be more, quote, economically viable a decision to change things for profit, not for the vision of the music itself. And I'm just using, I'm just using T-Swift as an example. It's, it's literally been happening for ever. Creative decisions made for the sake of profit have been happening forever. I know T-Swift does some good things with her money. I looked into it. And so on one hand, it's like that money is having a positive impact in X, Y, or Z ways, but also it being manipulated by corporate entities to maximize profit. Uh, you know, I, I just, it's, it's gross. It's weird. And I don't want to downplay her or anyone else's artistic integrity. I'm sure that she battles with record executives all the time to not change, uh, to not change things in her music. And I'm sure, I'm sure she personally wants her vision, her vision to stay pure. At the end of the day, that's what she would like. But there are changes being made for profit regardless. And that's just an it's it's just an interesting conundrum to be in. When art and entertainment get commodified on that level, and at what point is it doing a disservice for the for the culture of humanity? I, and, and like I said, I'm not demonizing T-Swift. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just using her as an example. We can look at Elvis. We can look at NSYNC. We can look at current K-pop bands. Take your pick. I'm just using T-Swift here. And to take it further down the rabbit hole, let's talk a little bit about the convergence of art and entertainment. There is a Venn diagram here. People pay money to be entertained and people also pay money to experience the creative vision of their favorite musical artists. Let's say you get a ticket to see your favorite band, and you're stoked. You secure your ticket, but when you get to the show, they don't play any of the songs you want to hear. They play a bunch of new stuff and stuff you've never heard, and you're, you know, you're excited about seeing them and that you got to see them, but you're a bit less entertained than you would have been because they didn't play any of any of your jams. They, in essence, didn't entertain you the way you wanted. You paid for an experience you didn't get. And I've actually been in this very situation, as I feel like most people who have been to a fair amount of concerts have. Were you cheated? Did they rob you? They shared their artistic expression with you, their soul, but they didn't necessarily entertain you. The point I'm trying to make is that the intention can be different when you get into the blurry lines of art versus entertainment. They are two 
different things, but they cannot exist on their own. And at the risk of sounding like a complete hipster douche, we have a lack of awareness of art happening in the United States, in my opinion. We need to start going out of our way to look for things that have a bit more of the art percentage and a bit less of the entertainment percentage. And don't get me wrong, at all. There are still amazing albums and movies and shows that slip through the cracks of the corporations all the time. Huge budget things that are very artful and very profound. But for every major label masterpiece, there are dozens and dozens of independent masterpieces that fly under the radar that aren't recognized because they don't have a zillion dollar marketing budget. And like I said, I know I sound like a douchey hipster, but I think I think it's important to go out of our way to explore music, cinema, art, shows, whatever the art form is, that aren't just strictly presented to you. Because that's where you'll consistently find art that resonates with you when you seek it out. Hey yo, so this is like the middle of the show and I wanted to first of all thank everyone for dialing into this podcast. I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that you are sharing this experience with me. If you'd like to support the podcast, leaving a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening to this on goes a really, really long way. Also, if you are able to leave a review for the podcast, uh, that also goes an an extremely long way. Uh, Another way you can support the podcast, other than just telling your friends and family about it, is signing up on my Patreon. There is a link in the description of this episode and all the episodes, or you can just go to patreon.com and search for Mount Analog, M-T period A-N-A-L-O-G-U-E. You get early access to podcasts, early access to my music, um, early access to art, and all kinds of other cool stuff. However you support, I cannot thank you enough. Infinite, infinite, infinite thank yous. I love you. Infinite blessings to you. Let's get back to the podcast. So taking this back to music specifically, I feel like there is a bit of awareness going on to a degree about this conundrum. There, uh, There's a shift going on in popular stuff. It's getting a little weirder in a good way. And I feel like we are on the verge of a creative renaissance. I don't want to sound like I don't want to sound like it's all bad. There is absolutely a shift happening and I like the shift that is happening. I mean, I like a lot of bigger artists too. I don't want to say that I'm not listening to 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 huge uh hugely popular artists. I don't want to put that I don't want to like imply that like I only listen to the under I only live in the underground, bro. Like no, I like really popular artists too. And I think even on their level, there's a really cool shift of artistry happening that they're starting to, we're starting to see stuff get more popular that slices to the core of the human soul. And at the end of the day, the intentions of really popular artists are a full spectrum. They're all over the place with varying levels of corporate interference. But I still think there is definitely room to grow. And this and this is one way that I feel like streaming services are kind of cool. We are consistently seeing independent artists not signed to any label at all getting popular, slipping through the cracks and getting to the masses. And it's happening more now than it ever has in modern music. It's something that I really don't think the record companies saw coming. They didn't anticipate this, and it's really cool. And the rep, the record companies are becoming this obsolete middle entity, like this obsolete middleman in the, in the midst of this mutating music industry. And I don't want to imply that all record companies are bad, because that's just not the truth. That's just nothing works on a, on a binary like that, but... The big ones, the big record companies, are usually really shady, super shady. So it's cool to see 
them relinquish this control that they have over the music industry. And I feel like that's going to have and is having a big impact on culture. People are getting shown a bit more raw stuff. They're getting shown a bit more of the artful, intentional music because the record labels are dying. And it's funny, too, at the same time, because the bigger record labels are seeing this. They're seeing the, the weird, artful stuff make it to the surface and shown to millions of people. And they're, they're, they're letting people on their own labels get a little bit more weird, too, because they realize that that is, air quote, economically viable. <laughs> It's like a snake eating its own tail. It's a, it's a, it's an, it's a cycle of infinite influence reflecting back at itself. The labels see pure artists making it to success, so they're allowing their the artists they're allowing their artists that they have signed to get a little more pure and raw and have less influence. And they're stepping out of the studio and being like, "Hey, not only can you do what you want, do what you want," because people really. People really fuck with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's cool. It's pure it, It's pure intention. And it, at least for this moment in time, it's taking hold in a big way. And it's beautiful to see. Bouncing back to something I was talking about before, music doesn't just influence individuals in specific societies alone. It unites different societies and cultures all around the world. It's working on a micro and a macro scale. And I'm talking about fusion. As humans, we travel about. We explore different cultures. If not actually physically, we read about them, we watch movies about them, we experience them either first or third hand. But we travel, we explore, in whatever capacity that looks like. I was reading this paper by a student at Spokane College, and they were identifying all of the components that make a culture a culture. And I know I've been saying culture a lot on this episode, but I can I I kind of can't not say it if we're going to talk about music. Um, But these components were broken down, these components of culture were broken down into language, religion, arts, music, dance, instrument making, etc., values and beliefs, marriage and family, political organization, substances, which are food, clothing, shelter, and economics. And all of these components are reflected in music. And they're reflected in music that people make across the world, And when we experience music from different places, we experience a glimpse of all of these components. And I know I know this because I make music, and my music is a regurgitation of my experience filtered through my brain and my perception. And I'm a white 30-something male that lives in the United States in Ohio. My regurgitation of the experience of my reality will absolutely be different than a 40-year-old Argentinian woman who lives on a farm. We might dabble in the same genres, and we might use uh, the same instruments, and we might even be on the same record label. But what she's lived and what I've lived are two very, very different experiences. And that is going to, without a doubt, be reflected in our music, our spiritual experiences, family experiences, our values, our beliefs are all going to be different. And this is how music works on a macro scale to connect us. By listening to this 40-year-old Argentinian farmer, I get a glimpse at what she's seen, a taste of her life. I empathize with her experience and become aware that we are connected. And maybe she values things that I've lost sight of. Or maybe she has a philosophy on God that I hadn't considered. By being open to her music and the sharing of her experience, I grow. 
and get a deeper connection to the life web of humanity. All through the power of music and all through the embedding of intention. And maybe her music makes me dance, and I get all of those doses of dopamine and lowered levels of cortisol, and now I want to find more music from Argentina. And I do. And then I maybe, maybe I start incorporating their stylings into my own music out of respect and appreciation, and then the global culture expands and mutates and connects even deeper. And that's one of the many ways this macro connection is currently happening. Music is really sacred and special. So now I want to get into the spiritual, um, more metaphysical spiritual side of music. And long before the modern age that we're in now, music was mostly used in religious contexts. It was a way to build and connect a community and a way to also connect with God in all of God's representations. If you listened to my episode about Hinduism, shameless plug, um, then you already know that they believe in a divine frequency, a divine frequency God entity called Brahman. It's this eternal frequency that resonates through the essence of existence and is this holy divine sound. For thousands of years before this age we're in, the biggest use of music in culture was to accompany spiritual ceremonies. It was to take the listener's mind into a place of clarity to commune with God or the eternal life web, whatever you want to call God, the self, the us, the all. Native Americans um, and Native Australians and many other um, many other ancient societies on Earth would use drums and voice to activate trance-like states to alter our or elevate our consciousness and to to communicate with God. Buddhists, monks, and people who just practice Buddhism in general um, to prepare for meditation they would and do chant. And these chants are forms of, of, of musical verse or incantation. There's a rhythm, there's a cadence, there's an order to the chanting. It's music and it's priming the, it's priming the chanters to get ready to communicate with God. It's using music to enter those states of altered consciousness. For Christians... They have hymns, and I still I still have some hymns ingrained in my head from my youth. I'm sure whenever I'm in the memory unit in the future, I will remember the hymns. Someone might start singing one, and I won't know what I am doing, but I will remember the hymns. <laughs> and some of those hymns actually slapped. They were hits, and God would be proud of those earworms, but... Of course, their function is to praise God and honor God, and it's not necessarily the uh, spiritual path that I, <laughs> that I that I stuck with. Obviously, for my life, I didn't. I'm, I wouldn't. I would consider myself still a Christian in some capacities, uh, but not in others. But either way, regardless of what I consider myself or not, the hymns slapped. Bringing it back to Hindu music, they are surprising. They are not surprisingly the most musical of spiritual paths. They have Vedas that are dedicated to songs and poems, and and they have a variety of music styles and genres that go with different ceremonies. And then bouncing over to uh, Europe, like I said, we're bouncing on this episode. We've all heard of the many European composers that wrote masterpieces for the church. Intricate, ornate works um, that they got hired to make for churches. A ton of the heavy hitters, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Berlioz, and countless other ones. Music was very important to the church. So important that they would hire personal composers and also the churches wanted not like even beyond the importance of the intricacy of the music churches also wanted people to keep coming back to the churches 
where they would be entertained. This is another convergence of art and entertainment, but also tack on spirituality. Because way back when this was happening, most people in Europe weren't really in the presence of music unless they were at church, and the church really wanted to impress them, really wanted to give them something that sounded divine, and also something that seemed deserving to return to their church, or deserving of being in awe of their church. And then we're going to bounce to Islamic music. There are a wide range of prayers in the Islamic faith that are all musical. They sing or chant when they pray to Allah. There's also in Islamic music, Sufi music, which Sufis are a mystical body found within the Islamic faith. They are all over the world and focus on creating music to honor God. They use flutes, drums, sitars, all manner of instruments with singing to create songs that aim to honor Allah and bring people closer to Him. They're kind of like the bards of Islam, and some of them throughout time have been have been like like superstars. There's been like superstar Sufi music creators. And one thing that I was reading about uh, Islamic music and Sufi music was that it is, for the most part, monophonic, meaning it has only one melody line. Everything in performance is based on the refinement of the melody line and the complexity of the beat. Like, they have some small uh, counter melodies and harmonies that go along with the melodies, but the centerpiece of the Su- of Sufi music and, and Islamic music is, like I said, monophonic. So if you're not, if t- to kind of explain it a little better, think of a stringed instrument, and instead of strumming multiple strings and creating a chord, you're just using one finger on one string and moving that finger up and down that string and creating melodies that only hit individual notes at any given time. There, that, is the, that is the focus of Islamic and Sufi music, is to refine monophonic melodies. And then, of course, we have Rastafarian music, which has many, many, many chapters. And then we also have um, music is a huge part of the Jewish faith. It's, it's present in prayers and ceremonies and written for special occasions. But I could literally go on forever about how music and religion and spirituality are intertwined. But I wanted to keep bouncing and bounce, uh, I wanted to talk about how cultures use music to represent who they are and the struggles they've overcome. One of those, one of those ways is that almost every country has a national anthem of some kind. And a decent amount of these anthems are stories of overcoming adversity and uniting under a common goal. Whether or not that goal is always actualized or not is a different story. But the reality is these anthems or state songs are really good at uniting people and instilling a sense of love for one's country or fellow people. Sometimes the intention, unfortunately, is propaganda from the government to love the government, and that really sucks. Um... But most of the time, the lyrics of these songs are about how the country started and what the people had to go through to make that happen. And then on the flip side of the national anthems, we have protest songs and songs of the downtrodden. And there are endless songs in, that fall into this category. Some of those songs are songs that were written by slaves in America songs that were written to raise the spirits of slaves while they did what they were forced to do, and songs that were written to unite and instill hope among slaves. And then also, on an even bigger scale, slaves would embed secret meanings to the lyrics so that they could plan to escape. When a slave would sing about stealing away, they were planning on escaping soon. Or when they, when they uh, 
saying the lyrics of Sweet Chariot, it was to let other other slaves know about about which direction they were going or in which way they were planning on traveling. Probably the most famous um, slave song was Follow the Drinking Gourd, which was a reminder to remember to look up to the sky to see the Big Dipper and that the Big Dipper would take you north where you needed to go to get to freedom. And then we have the song We Shall Overcome, which was based on the gospel song of the same name, written by Reverend Dr. Charles Albert Tindley, who was one of the most influential African-American ministers of the 20th century. And We Shall Overcome became synonymous with the black civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. The song was originally said to be sung by tobacco workers striking in Charleston, South Carolina in 1945, by 1950, the song became a favorite among activist singers like Pete Seeger, and by 1963, Joan Baez was leading a crowd of 300,000 protesters at the Lincoln Memorial uh, to this song, and in 1968, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. quoted the lyrics in his last sermon before he was assassinated. And in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there are so many protest songs of empowerment. Song, there, there are too many to count, but some of the big ones that you may have heard are Get Up, Stand Up by Bob Marley, Give Peace a Chance by John Lennon, Times They Are a Changin' by Bob Dylan, What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. Then a little later on, we get songs like Fuck the Police by N.W.A., Killing in the Name of by Rage Against the Machine, and back in the 60s, like when the U.S. was sending troops over to Vietnam and songwriters in the U.S. were making anti-war music, songwriters in Vietnam were also writing anti-war music. Songs against the U.S. and French invasions. And China has songs of revolution against their oppressive government. Russia has songs of revolution. France has songs of revolution. If if there if there is a social or political or or any kind of of revolution or or cultural movement happening, there is certainly music involved. It's either talking about the struggles or empowering the people, or they're they're just infinitely intertwined. Music and socio political and cultural change are infinitely intertwined. Music is powerful, and it's been operating to fuel the collective process of change and empowerment since the beginning of modern society. And in that way, it has a definite utility function. When I was, like, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but when I was doing this research and looking at different articles and essays, I saw several times people saying that the function of music in society is to keep people alive, to keep humans alive, growing and expanding. And if you think about the protest songs and revolution songs, they absolutely serve this purpose. They work to make things better, and they work to help us survive, thrive, and grow. And with that, I want to get into a segment on the podcast called Let's Ask AI. Let's Ask AI. I asked AI, if you were a music critic, what would you have to say about the last decade of music in terms of cultural impact? AI answered, the last decade of music has been a dynamic and transformative period in terms of cultural impact. It witnessed the rise of streaming platforms, which revolutionized how people consume music and reshaped the industry's revenue model. Genres like hip-hop and pop continued to dominate, reflecting the changes, tastes, and demographics of listeners. Social media played a pivotal role in promoting artists and connecting them with their fans. Artists leveraged platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter to engage with audiences, promote their music, and spark viral trends. Furthermore, 
the decade saw a surge in global and cross-cultural collaborations, blurring genres, boundaries, and introducing listeners to a more diverse range of sounds. K-pop, for instance, gained immense popularity worldwide, demonstrating the power of international music movements. In terms of criticism, some argue that commercialism and formulaic approaches have occasionally overshadowed artistic innovation. However, others celebrate the democratization of music production and distribution, allowing independent artists to thrive and challenge the mainstream. Overall, the last decade of music has been marked by innovation, technology, and cultural diversity with its impact felt not only through chart-topping hits, but also in the way music shapes our identities and experiences. That It kind of touched on one thing, on one like area of all of this that I didn't really get into, with like the social media impact of music, and the viral, like how something can become viral really quickly, and change the global perception of things. So, thanks for touching on that, AI. I mean, I kind of got into that a little bit, but that's a whole... <laughs> I know I always say it, but that's a, that's a whole podcast episode on its own. Let's get on to the fun facts of the episode, and then we'll wrap this thing up. This first fun fact is actually a myth. It's something that I saw over and over online, but then I watched one, like, 20, 20 25-minute-ish video talk, like, debunking this myth. So if you see this online, it's a lie. A tritone is a musical interval of three whole steps, or six semitones, between two notes. At some point, the tritone developed a reputation as an evil, discordant sound. You'll often hear it repeated that the Catholic Church considered the tritone so malicious that it was banned in musical compositions. Which is a cool, it's a very clickbaity thing to say. And I, like, part of me wants it to be true. But when I was, when I was, uh, trying to find, you know, like, fact checked this online, there were so many musical compositions that were written during this time that used the tritone that it's like, this is just very clearly debunked. Look at all of these songs that have tritones in them. <laughs> so, first one fact is actually a, uh, debunking of a, of a misconception. Second fun fact is that there is an astro- that there was an astronaut that released an album with all songs being recorded in space. A Canadian astronaut named Chris Hadfield released his first album in 2015, which was recorded while he was orbiting space. He became the first Canadian to walk in space, but his cover of David Bowie's Space Oddity also went viral. Hadfield spent 144 days at the International Space Station recording his 11 original songs for his appropriate titled album, Space Sessions, Songs from a Tin Can. That's kind of a tongue twister. Space Sessions, Songs from a Tin Can. I haven't listened to the album, but but it's on my to-do list this week. I want to hear this space album. So there's something about, like... Because space is a vacuum, and sound doesn't necessarily work in space. I know it, it, like it can work in space, but for the most part, like sound doesn't work in vacuums because there's no air pressure, and that's how sound works. It's like a manipulation of air pressure. So the thought of someone making music in space in a pressurized tin can <laughs> is just really intriguing on my to-do list to listen to. The next fun fact is that none of the Beatles could write or read music. Paul McCartney finally admitted that neither he nor any of the Beatles' bandmates were able to read or write music. During a 2018 interview, McCartney said that the music just came to him and his bandmates, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, and George Harrison, and it was never written down. That one I actually did know, but it's pretty wild to think that, like, the most popular band in the world that has probably ever been, might ever will be, I don't know, we'll see. (laughs) Um, They couldn't read or write music, but they were great songwriters. It's, I mean, that's an empowering fun fact, is like, 
I don't need to know how to write this down or how to read this to make music. And you really don't. That's the truth. Fact number four is that music education leads to better exam scores. Studying music is an actual workout for your brain. Learning an instrument has been proven to help students in myriad ways, from mastery of memorization, pattern recognition, and emotional development. Students who have experience with music performance or taking music appreciation courses score higher on the SATs. One report indicated that they score on average 63 points higher on verbal and 44 points higher on math on the SATs. So there it is, folks. Music makes you smarter. Boom. Fact number five, and this fact blew my mind. I had never heard of this, and I'm just going to... I took notes on it here, but I'm just going to break it down for you. Um, there's this composer. There was this composer. He's no longer with us, but there was this composer named John Cage. And if you're not familiar with John Cage, he was known for making really insane uh, compositions and doing really weird social experiments with music. For instance, he had this one uh, musical composition that required you to rev a lawnmower in the middle of it. And he, 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 he's done all these other experiments like playing drums underwater and um, using instruments that he invented and creating songs with them and writing really atonal, um, abstract piano pieces and stuff. He's, he's like a composer whose primary focus was on experimentation and avant-garde, uh, avant-garde compositions and stuff. But he wrote this piece called As Slow As Possible. And for decades, like, okay, so the, the composition itself... At the, it's just a it's sheet music, and at the, at the beginning of it, it just says, "Play this." The instructions are play this as slow as possible. So for decades, people have been challenging and upping the ante with how slow they can play this piece of music. Someone in the early two thousands played it for fourteen and a half hours. And then someone a few years after that wound up playing it for a full 24 hours. This is like how long it took them to play this. I'm pretty sure it's an eight-page composition. This is how long they took to play it. They tried to play it as slow as possible. But currently, right now, there is a group of music philosophers in Germany that started in 2001, that planned to make this composition last 639 years. And the way that they're doing this is that they built an organ, and they installed it in a church, and they mapped out how long each note takes. Some of the notes take thousands of days, some of the notes only take like 30 days. Some of them take 100 days. But whenever the next note needs to be played, someone goes with sandbags and depresses pedals on a pipe organ and begins the next note. So the hope is that this 639-year composition and experiment will be passed down generation to generation to generation and parts of the organ will have to be replaced during it. And parts of, you know, like, the sandbags will have to... It'll be something that, like, father will pass to son, will pass to son. Or human will pass to human, will pass to human. And it just blew my mind. I was like, I've never heard of anything this... Uh, any sort of music experiment this extravagant or with this much planning. You can see pictures of it online. Just look for John Cage as slow as possible organ. They have pictures of this organ. It's like encased so that it doesn't disrupt the church. <laughs> and the reason that they did the sandbag thing, like why not just automate the organ? Because just like programming an organ, it wouldn't be a performance. 
they need people to place the sandbags and to press the pedals for it to qualify as like a performance. So yeah, sorry for that long, (laughs) for the long winded last fun fact, but that one really just shook me when I was reading about it. It just kind of blew my mind. And I encourage you to go look at some pictures of this organ. It's super trippy. Music is so, so special. It connects all of us on fundamental levels. It's a cornerstone of culture and a beautiful gift to the world. It helps us think. It helps us laugh. It helps us cry. It helps us dance and and feel and express ourselves. It is sacred and it is important. Thank you, music. I'll see you all next time. Until then, remember to check on your mental health and remember to check on the mental health of your loved ones. Bye. Analog thoughts. Analog thoughts. Analog thoughts. Analog thoughts. Analog thoughts.